Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the launch of my school today. My name is Amanda Abram, and I will be your moderator for the session. I just wanted to start out with some brief housekeeping items. So we're going to hear from a variety of speakers today, keynote speakers and panelists. We would appreciate if you would please keep your microphones on mute and you can post, post any questions that you might have in the chat as we will have a Q&A portion later in this session. So just to give you some brief background on why we are gathered here today is um, SDGs Today is launching My Schools Today, hashtag I mapped my school, the call to action launch event. Now SDGs Today was launched by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network in partnership with ESRI and the National Geographic Society to advance the production of timely data on the sustainable development goals. Today, they are launching a data set using open source data to share national population counts and various travel distances from recorded educational facilities across Africa. They will be doing this using OpenStreetMap technology. Now, we are happy to invite you to the launch of my school today, a call to action to encourage students, local communities, and other stakeholders to map schools and contribute to the ongoing development of data and progress towards SDG 4, quality education. Now, I would like to introduce our first keynote and welcome speaker. That will be Mr. Chief Nathaniel Ebonarsko, the Executive Director of the Millennium Promise Alliance. He has over 17 years of practical field experience as a community health and development communications expert and has held a variety of positions at the national, regional, district, and community level in Ghana. His rich experience has earned him deep involvement in projects with the Ministry Ministries of Health, Employment, Education, Gender, and Local Governance. And we are so honored to always have the opportunity to work with him and with his leadership and initiatives throughout Ghana. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to him to welcome us to this amazing session today. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, good morning to everyone. And, uh, Good afternoon to my colleagues on the African continent. I'm very pleased to be here today for the launching of my school today. It is my pleasure to welcome all our guests and our eminent speaker, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, to share his rich experience in the Mapping School Location Project. I'm equally honored to welcome the Honorable Minister for Education, Ghana, who is in the person of Dr. Yao Osei Educhum to this program. Education plays a critical role towards the achievement of sustainable development goals with a specific attention on improving life opportunities for the hard to reach and the vulnerable in society. The SDGs were formed to improve on the accomplishments of the Millennium Development Goals. Aside ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities as captured under the SDG4, education contributes directly to the SDGs addressing poverty reduction and reduce inequalities, health, nutrition, economic growth, and labor market opportunities, as well as patients. Education, therefore, should be recognized as a catalyst to meeting many of the most important development challenges that exist today. As governments and international community increasingly focus on ICT to addressing most of the needs of its citizens, it is crucial to leverage on ICT to improve educational planning. One of the essential reasons for educational planning is economic efficiency in resource, resource application. A very vital part of educational planning is school mapping. Education has a transformational role to play in addressing all developmental challenges the world faces today. MPA has over the years partnered with several governments in the sub-region to make attempts at leveraging on ICT to advance education through mapping and other things. At that 
time, we called it, um, we called it, um, um, what do you call it? Um, RFA, uh, RFA, that is um, making sure that we assess all the um, facilities that can contribute to making sure that the proximity of uh, school facilities are accessible to all, irrespective of where you find yourself. And it's very important that at this point where UNSDSN is attempting to make sure that we bring this to the doorsteps of all other developing countries, we all embrace it with all arms and make sure that we put our shoulders to this reel and move it to the right direction. We therefore, on this note, would like to thank you all for your time and wish all of us a pleasant contribution towards this launch. And beyond the launch, we would want to see all governments and other institutions take it up and make sure that we run with it. And then we will all be very happy to see the results of how we are able to help identify, map out schools, and in so doing, help us to know how we can apply the resources equitably and efficiently. On this note, I would like to thank you for your time and wish all of us a pleasant launch. Thank you. Thank you so much to Chief Nathaniel for that amazing welcome. We are so glad to have you here and we definitely are going to hear from many distinguished speakers today. We will move right along to our three keynote speakers. First, we will have the Honorable Dr. Ya Use Aduntum, the Minister of Education of Ghana. He dreams of a Ghana where every child, regardless of their background, whether poor or privileged, will be afforded equal opportunity towards education. Access, equity, quality is what he intends to bring to education in Ghana. School reform and emphasis on STEM and STEAM. And he believes that it's important to prepare students to be career ready, teaching the 21st century skills, which are critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. We are so honored to have you here with us today. Just to say after that, we will have um, Dr. Jeffrey D. Sachs, the president of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He is a world-renowned economist, professor, best-selling author, innovative educator, and a global leader in sustainable development. He serves in a variety of positions as an SDG advocate and has twice been named among Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders. Thank you so much for joining us today as a keynote speaker. And our last keynote will be Dr. Radhika Yenger, the Director of Education at the Center for Sustainable Development. She has rich practical and academic experiences in international education, and her scholarship has been featured all over the world. She is also here in her capacity as a Secretariat member of Mission 4.7, a new initiative to push transformative education and target 4.7, which brings together approximately approximately 50 technical education experts and high level leaders across the world working on education. We're so happy to have all of you here today. So first, I would like to turn it over to the Minister of Education of Ghana, the Honorable Dr. Yause Aduntum. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful opportunity, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, our Chief Nat, and our fellow panelists. It's a great opportunity uh, to be with you uh, today. I'm excited uh, by the invitation extended to me to work closely with you. And uh, today we are going to have the opportunity to share with you some of the things that we're doing and how uh, the system that you developed in, uh, for school mapping is going to be of great help uh, to us. Uh, since 2016, Ghana began the um, project mapping all schools, senior high schools. Uh, this was funded through a World Bank program that we participated in called the Secondary Education Improvement Project. And secondary schools have been mapped. And uh, now we have begun a very interesting uh, project of reconfiguring junior high schools. Uh, by the way, the interesting thing about the Ghanaian junior high school system is that since 1987, when we decided that junior high schools uh, should be a spread catered in a way from the senior high schools, we've had a very interesting junior high school system going on. In our junior high schools, uh, we don't have the same facilities as the high school. So you go to a junior high school, we have uh, the science labs are not there, libraries are not there, 
and it's limiting what we can do within our secondary education space. So the government under the president and our Dr. Tufado had decided that a junior high school should be brought up to par our senior high schools, which means we are now mapping all the junior high schools uh, to in, in certain mid-sized towns, you may have like 11 of them. We're trying to see, okay, where can we place a new junior high school that would take over all the students from the 11 junior high schools so that we can have efficiency gains. So it's not just mapping for its own sake, but we are mapping so that children can walk to the nearest new junior high school that has science labs, that have libraries and have computer labs, and that has all the facilities that the senior high schools have. So in a typical town um, with 11 junior high schools, the interesting thing is when you map them, you begin to say, okay, if I place a junior high school at this location, all the children can walk. And instead of 11 schools, I'm going to have one school now, instead of 11 head teachers, I'm going to have one head teacher and maybe two assistants. And now the second supervisor, who is the inspector of schools, can stay at that school uh, two days or three days a week. And, and what it means is this, the mapping is a means to an end. Because you see, the mapping now allows you, once you place the junior high school in the location that you want, uh, allows you to cut down the number of head teachers and the head teacher allowances that you have to provide. It allows you to have a library which was hitherto not possible to have because you couldn't have those 11 libraries. You couldn't have those 11 science labs. You couldn't have those 11 libraries. Now, once you map and you set up one school, what it means is this. You now have one school with the science labs and you have about 1,000 students who are accommodated there. You have one headmaster inside our 11 headmasters. And then the interesting thing that we find after we map all the schools and do uh, the, the look at the staffing is that in some schools, we have a teacher who is there and they're only teaching every other day. On all the other, uh, the every other day, other days they don't have anything to teach. They have 70 students, but they have the full complement of teachers. So once you do the mapping, you find the relocation, the efficiency gains from the management and of things, the efficiency gains from the teacher uh, staffing, then down the line pay for cost of the construction. So when we look at the school that we are building now, that has everything that the 21st century school has, we end up also saving on the teacher end of things. In a, in a typical 11 junior high school kind of community, what we've realized is that instead of 120 teachers, we can reduce it to 80 teachers. We have 40 teachers who can then be sent to communities without teachers. So the mapping tools that we are using is now giving us the opportunity to reorganize our education system and put us in a situation where the efficiency gains is also leading to improve in quality learning outcomes because the supervisor doesn't have to move to 11 schools. He can stay in this school for two days and bring about the improvement that is a new dinner. So school mapping, as we see it, is a means to an end. And in fact, it's a very, very important aspect of what we're doing here. We're also using it to look at communities that have limited number of schools. So where we just have depended upon community initiative to build schools, now we are looking at the mapping, giving us a heads up and say, hey, this community is standing. How many schools do you have within a kilometer? How do you ensure that we have enough schools to cater for the population within a certain geographical distance? And how do you reduce the distance in such a way that children are not going that far to access schools? So it's, it's such a simple tool. You hear mapping and, and you hear a survey, but the efficiency gains of it in terms of education is what really excites me about the, this initiative that you embark upon. It's going to make our life much easier. We're going to use the tool very well to really bring about reorganization of education, reconfiguration of junior high school in Ghana. And for that matter, we then also map out the primary schools onto the junior high school and it gives you a clear sense of the deficiencies and how you can maximize opportunities for education. I'm very excited that uh, Prof. Sachs and your team have put this together and we're going to use it to improve what we are already doing to really 
uh, bring about that efficiency. And I think in the future years, what we are looking at research on how using mapping and locating new junior high schools have helped the Ghanaian education system to really transform itself to give us quality six years of secondary education. Uh, because now we are uh, putting schools together with all that we need in a high school. And I'm very excited by the opportunity that we are going to get, even with the deployment of this new uh, mapping uh, system. Thank you so much for um, this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for those words, Minister, um, and for sharing the mapping that you're doing already in Ghana, as well as sharing your exemplary leadership to dedicate this as a means to an end to achieve quality education. Thank you for your time. We are so glad that you were able to join us and will be a champion for these types of projects and innovations. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Professor Jeffrey D. Sachs for his keynote remarks. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks to everybody for joining and uh, thanks colleagues for launching my school today. Uh, Minister, uh, your remarks were really inspiring, absolutely fascinating, extremely important for us. Uh, and I think really the kind of guidance uh, that we need. We sense that having real time up-to-date global maps of where the schools are will make a huge difference, but you're proving the point and you're giving a, a lot of crucial ideas about how to use the information that will be uh, developed in this project. Please count on us to be with you. Uh, you know that Chief Nat uh, is there to help support you in any way and our whole team at SDSN and Millennium Promise Alliance are completely with you. Ghana, by the way, to everybody, is just an exemplary leader in pushing forward on the quality of education. It's extremely important that President Akufo-Addo, uh, early in his first term, took SDG 4 and said, this calls on us for universal completion of secondary education. And in doing so said, therefore, we're going to ensure that secondary education is available for every student, every learner in Ghana. We're going to make it free and available for all. And that is the kind of breakthrough that you say, wow, that's really crucial. And that I use to give examples all over the world to say, you need to follow Ghana's lead to make sure that every child is going to receive a quality education all the way from pre-K through uh, completion of secondary education at the least. Now, this uh, idea of mapping schools globally brings in another crucial element, of course, and that is a crowdsourcing of knowledge and engagement in the SDGs. Because with the tools that uh, SDGs today is bringing to this project, everybody can participate in describing where your schools are, in geographically tagging them. And I hope over time in building up databases school by school so that we can take the minister's uh, wisdom and guidance and help uh, ministers of education and district officials all over the world to make the most of this information. It would be wonderful, especially in the COVID period, if we knew where are the students each day, which schools are open, which schools have been closed because of COVID, a teacher sick or uh, the district is uh, being hit by the pandemic, so it's uh, closed the schools. Which schools have online capacity? Uh, what's the quality of the connectivity? How can we expand online learning? Well, one way is to know uh, what the capacities of the schools are right now in terms of physical infrastructure and the software and the tra training of teachers and students for using these new technologies. And I would assume, Minister, that <clears throat> another thing that can be done in addition to the great uh, spatial dynamics that you have underway now where uh, you're using the uh, Apex High School to help uh, shape higher quality of the junior high schools, that we can use digital 
technologies uh, effectively so that maybe a, a master teacher or really well-qualified science teacher or specialist or mathematics teacher can teach for a whole district uh, in places where there might not be uh, that quality. And I, I want to ensure that every school everywhere has the connectivity to be able to get online information, to be able to use digital services, to be able to be in connected classrooms uh, around the world or within districts so that we can use all the tools that we have uh, at our disposal. Now, SDSN, uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network is a global network. Uh, it's a network of especially universities and think tanks around the world committed to the sustainable development goals. SDG4, which brings us uh, all together today, calls for quality education for all learners and universal education from pre-K through upper secondary as an absolute baseline. Well, COVID was a terrible setback to this because hundreds of millions of kids simply didn't have school. Uh, in rich places, maybe it was possible to go online, but even in almost anywhere in the world, there was a digital divide of who could participate online and who could not. But in poorer districts, poorer places, it was not possible to just shift online and have universal coverage. So we're trying through this project, first of all, to help get the schools everywhere back and operating to understand where are the schools, how are they functioning, uh, where is learning taking place? And then together with uh, UNESCO, together with the great leaders uh, like Minister Adutum, uh, we are trying to ensure quality education everywhere and to bring added resources to bear. So I would say to the minister also, part of our job is you tell us what's needed. I'm out there wanting to campaign for you to get you the added resources so that you can really get the job done. If you say, I have a plan, but it requires a few million dollars more, but what a return, because this is the most important investment that any society can make any time is in its children, no doubt the highest return socially, economically, politically, in every way. So I want to make sure that we're also using this project effectively to mobilize the resources needed for quality education for all. We're about to hear from Dr. Radhika Yangar, who is my dear colleague at Columbia University and SDSN, on another aspect of our journey which is, uh, as Amanda mentioned to you, 4.7, a target under SDG 4. Because target 4.7 says not only should all children be learning and receiving quality education and completing higher education, but they should be learning about sustainable development. And that's another challenge that is a big one. You know, sometimes the school curriculum uh, doesn't even help students to understand what's in front of our eyes, like the climate change that is disrupting the whole planet right now, the massive heat waves, the droughts, the floods, or to help students understand COVID-19 for that matter, because that's a matter of understanding ecology, epidemiology, uh, how uh, disease transmission operates, principles of public health, which also should be part of a sustainable development curriculum. So Radhika will be uh, telling us about all of the global partnership to also infuse the knowledge of sustainable development within the curriculum during the next 10 years. I'm excited for all of the SDSN network globally to be come foot soldiers, if I could put it that way, all over the world in my school today, mapping, teaching young kids how to map, how to use geographic tools, how to use a, a, a tablet or a smartphone to help put their school on the global map. And for all of the data 
scientists that are engaged in this project to use this as a way to crowdsource the crucial information about the school's functions, its capacities, its infrastructure, its needs, so that we can really mobilize the real-time data to help Minister Adutum and all his colleagues around the world to make this revolution in quality education, which is by far the single most important investment we can make for sustainable development. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mariam Rabi. Thanks to Esri and National Geographic and all our partners uh, in my school today. It's such an exciting project. I'm so grateful that we have uh, the partnership uh, with the government of Ghana uh, in uh, getting this going, because this will be a, a powerful tool. Ghana's leadership will inspire countries all over the world uh, to make uh, the most of this. And I know that we can count on our networks to uh, help pull this off. So thanks to everybody. Uh, congratulations on the launch. Minister, so great to see you. Uh, and uh, Chief Nat, great to see you. And I'll turn it back to you, Amanda, so that we can introduce uh, uh, Dr. Iangar to everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh, Minister, would you like to go ahead and <laughs> respond? Oh, can I have you? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, it's always great to see Prof. Sachs. Um, this is wonderful. I'm super excited about this opportunity. And I, I think out of this, we are sowing seeds of transformation. And, and Ghana is going to take the lead on this. Um, very soon, some research will be done to see the impact of school mapping and improving <laughs> quality of teaching and learning. Uh -oh. and the opportunities that have been extended to us. We have our 15 schools that we're opening next year. And uh, the use of master teachers from one location linked to the others, I'm picking a prof. We're going to do it. And um, phenomenal. Of course, we need support. We're coming. <laughs> but, uh, we're going you to count get on it me. Done. We're <laughs> going to get it done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think, Professor Sachs, you gave us a great reminder that this is a collaborative effort, and Ghana has been showing a lot of leadership in this space. And we're really excited to keep working with the government of Ghana and all of our partners there. So, thank you for those remarks. Um, I would like to turn it over now to Dr. Radhika Iyengar, and she will discuss, as Professor Sachs said, more about Mission 4.7 and the new initiatives there. So, Dr. Radhika, over to you. Thank you, Amanda. And it's an honor to follow Professor Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Mr. Chief Nathaniel, as well as um, uh, Dr. Yao. So, um, welcome to this really wonderful initiative, uh, which is really very timely. Um, as we can see, uh, we have started, as we speak, there are many students who are coming back to school. And it's really uh, taken us many children, many months who have been out of the school network. And now we are coming back to school slowly and taking the education uh, aspect strongly. As Professor Sachs said that many students were out of the school network and uh, we were not able to reach them. So I think this pandemic has yet again taught us the importance of uh, community members, village leaders, town leaders, parents coming together for an integral part of uh, what we call well-functioning schools. And to make this happen, to make schools function again, I think that we need to have a big partnership. We need to have all the stakeholders involved. And uh, to me, I think there are two very important things that need to take place. One is we need to know where these schools are located so that we exactly know which community is left behind, who is not reaching the schools. And to be able to do that, I really welcome SDG today's uh, initiative. Uh, congratulations, Mariam, for uh, launching this event where we can now actually locate uh, where these schools are so that we can say these communities are left behind, these communities are joining, and then we can focus on the quality of education in the schools. I think uh, both Professor Sachs and uh, Dr. Yao mentioned um, these aspects of how to make the schools efficient uh, through this network, but our basic minimum uh, criteria is uh, we need to follow Ghana's lead to exactly know where these schools are located and mapping of the schools is very, very critical. I consider this as like a baseline of where we need to go beyond this. Um, uh, the second component, which Professor Sachs also mentioned, is the quality of education. 
and for this i want to discuss our mission uh, mission 4.7 which is focusing on um, sdg 4.7 actually implementing sdg 4.7 through two lenses education for sustainable development and global citizenship education uh, mission 4.7 brings in a lot of education leaders including uh, ban ki moon foundation unesco uh, sdsn's sdg academy uh, sdsn's global school network center for sustainable development this is where i am based at the earth institute at columbia university through our eco ambassadors program we have been focusing on quality of education uh, in many different countries including here in the united states which i feel is really lagging behind in many of the aspects on making education for sustainable development and global citizenship education uh, front runners in the education system here so through mission 4.7 uh, we have partnered with sdgs today uh, to focus on many quality aspects um, and uh, taking maybe uh, taking the two common missions that we have taking care of people and its planet i think are really very critical at this stage where we are just coming back from the pandemic and many things have happened uh, so far we've already started to work on many different aspects here uh, including our eco ambassadors program uh, where we partnered with esri we partnered with sdgs today to focus on uh, story maps uh, which bring in this aspect of sdgs learning about the sustainable development goal which i think is completely uh, missed out on being a big core of education in many countries uh, and so how can we bring the aspects global aspects of sdgs and how can we bring in the local stories and the local context and uh, through eco ambassadors program and through mission 4.7 working with sdgs today we've been able to combine uh, these aspects learning the sdgs and making it very local and very actionable it's not just learning about sdgs and and that's it we actually drive the action component as well so i would love for you to to look at the sdgs today website um we have the education component there the eco ambassadors program is listed there to see how can we actually make these story maps uh, learn about uh, you know how can we make use of these story maps to learn about the sdgs and how do we localize it to make action possible um so this is something that we really welcome and i hope that uh, through sdgs today's fantastic work on story maps and its partnership with esri national geographic and many other partners we will be able to drive sdgs bring them more local empower our students to learn about where the planet is going and what is their role in uh, taking care of its people and and its planet so welcome uh, to uh, the sdgs today uh, today's website and please look at all the details there it focuses on mission 4.7's focus on sdg 4.7 and i hope that this partnership with uh, minister of Edu minister of education in ghana as well as other world leaders who can take this work forward and make sure that mission 4.7 is actually a reality and is done at an international uh, level thank you for uh, uh, for your time amanda Thank you so much for those wonderful remarks and discussing more about Mission 4.7 and the plans to really make things actionable and taking forward this agenda and the importance of quality education, but education on broader themes as well to shape our society. Um, so thank you to all of our keynote speakers. We were so glad to have you. Thank you for your wonderful presentations and remarks. We will now be moving into a panel discussion with three additional speakers. And this panel discussion will be about the importance of timely data on school locations and enabling students how to make the data through their locations and communities. It will also be on understanding how the data that students are collecting or community members or that teachers are collecting can impact the policymaking processes and lead to improving quality education. The first panelists will be Mr. Jason Solly, the Global Manager for Schools at ESRI, and he leads the school GIS strategy and is responsible for partnerships worldwide, and we are really looking forward to hearing his presentation. 
The next panel speaker will be Miss Monica Nsiga, the Regional Director for Eastern and South Africa Hub at the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. In this role, she works across East Africa to support and amplify open source communities in about 24 countries in the region. We're really excited to hear about her expertise in this area. And lastly, we will have Miss Anita Mwagiru, the Deputy Project Lead for the SDG Students Program. And this is an initiative of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network youth. She is responsible for program strategy, implementation, and global recruitment across youth and university hubs across the region as well as internationally. We are really looking forward to hearing from these three panelists and they will each have um, about seven or eight minutes for their presentation. So I would like to turn it over first to Jason. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Okay. Hi everybody, uh, so my name is Jason Saul. Uh, I'm based in the UK, so I'm talking to you from the UK today. And I just wanted to take you through, uh, talking about some of our the ESRI technology very, very briefly on here, uh, just to give you a flavor of, uh, of who we are as a company. And so we're, we're a huge uh, mapping and technology company, essentially. Um, uh, I've been working with ESRI for at least 12 years, uh, and my main focus has always been at schools, whether it's actually this type of activity where it's schools, uh, planning and administration in here. And I know the uh, Schools Today uh, program is going to be using one of our apps called Survey123 uh, to collect data. And that's been uh, really, really well, well received in the education community, uh, as, both as a curriculum tool and also as a planning tool. And in this instance, the, the reason why it's so useful in this uh, context is the immediacy of the data. So it's really easy to set up. So you can, you can use it on a, on a phone or a tablet. And once you've collected your data, it's immediately into uh, a database where it can be easily shared, analyzed, uh, added to other maps or, or dashboards and this type of thing. So it's a really, really simple and easy way uh, to collect really timely uh, data and make it available to everybody uh, almost in an instant. In there. But this same technology, this same sort of survey one, two, three here, we've got our, our mapping platform. We can flip that around. So as well as actually doing education planning, we can also start to look at how does this technology work as a curriculum and a teaching and learning tool. So part of, a big part of what I do is around managing our, our schools program. So our schools program is free for all schools. And probably the mainstay of this is probably our Teach with GIS uh, uh, website. So how do you teach with this technology? How do you teach all sorts of different subjects, whether it's uh, computer science, whether it's geography? Uh, whether it's maths in here, through the medium of, of geospatial technology that's being used uh, for this project. And for uh, the uh, My Schools Today project, we've created some story maps that were mentioned in the previous uh, speaker, uh, with some activities that are really focused around this concept of the school. You know, how, how do we use the school uh, as, as a way to actually learn? You know? and I think there's a commonality. If we ask that question as a child, where am I and where is my school? In that space, there's a lot of learning can be had. And, uh, you know, so we've, I've created some uh, activities around here with student tasks. And the idea being is we want the students to be thinking about where they are, what's their journey. And through that simple process, they can start to be learning things around uh, mapping skills, about scale, about maths, uh, creative writing in here, biology, sustainability of their, of their, of their of their journey to school, their impact on it, looking at is it a local to global impact, and also helping the, the, uh, the students to think about how can they take action in here. So if they if they journey to school, is there an impact? If it's not that pleasant, what can they do? Well, we've got some resources we put together for the, uh, for the program uh, that will uh, help teachers uh, think about and create and adapt their own, uh, their own resources for, for the program. This can be used offline or online in there. So whatever the circumstance you're in as a teacher, there's something here for you in here. And again, we'll share the links to the various websites and the free resources uh, as part of the program in here. But again, the, the idea that this GIS geospatial technology has many different roles, even though it's the same technology, just the context is different. It could be used for education planning, it's curriculum, and it puts you on maybe a great pathway into a really interesting and useful uh, career in life. In there. It, certainly, it certainly worked, did that for me. In there. So that's it for me. I'm going to finish up uh, nice and quickly for you in there, but lots of free resources and lots of ways to work 
offline, online, depending on your circumstance. And uh, please uh, get in touch with me uh, via Twitter or via this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing specifically what you're doing with the mapping technology and how schools can get involved. And we'll also have a Q&A later after we hear from the two next panelists. So next, I would like to turn it over to Miss Monica to share her presentation with us. Hello, Amanda. Okay, it tells me the previous speaker was still sharing. You should be able to share now, it seems. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And um, hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Monica Ndiga, I am the regional Monica? director. Monica, yes? sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see the full presentation. Okay, sorry, just mm -hmm. one minute. Okay, are you able to see it now? Um, not yet. Are you sharing your screen? Yes. Um, it might be frozen right now. So how about you close out of it? Um, we can actually go to Anita quickly and then we can come back to you. Would that be okay? Yes, that would be okay. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So Anita, we'll go to you just to give your remarks and then we'll come back to Monica. Okay, thank you, that's fine. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening to you all. Um, so my name is Anita Mugger from Nairobi, Kenya and I am the Deputy Project Lead as has been mentioned at the SG Students Program and we deal with university um, engagement um, all over the world um, on the SDGs and um, about sustainable development as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit about how I started out with youth. So I have worked with youth and as a youth for more than five years. And during this time, I have worked with, in grassroots projects that sought to engage youth and the police in the area to work together to end police brutality. I have worked with youth to increase their employment chances. I have worked to provide basic necessities for children in orphanages. I have worked to increase youth participation and environmental cleanups and awareness. And now I work to increase engagement and participation on the SGs all over the world. Through this journey, I have seen the innovation, the steadfastness, perseverance, and power that youth possess. If only they are invested in and given a platform to raise their voice for the necessary changes to our society. Um, I'll just start with a small story from like this last year during the pandemic, which has truthfully affected, I think, children and youth in terms of their education the most, especially in emerging markets all over the world and Africa included as well. And um, it's been a time where people were very unmoored, especially as young people. And even as we had discussions with the various coordinators all over the world for our program, they would always come back to us and just say, I just want to go back to school because I know school is the pathway. It's the path that I want to take so that I can progress, so that I can lift myself up. And during this period, we've seen the innovation that all the students all over the world within our program have been able to do. For example, in South America, we had students who reached out to their university professors who had no idea how to use Zoom or how to use Microsoft Teams or any of the other platforms during this time. And having that um, partnership to be able to teach them how to use this product so that they can be able to in then in turn teach them because they didn't want to miss out or lose a year of school during this period. And in this, I would like to quote an uh, anonymous person who says that, we want our legacies to stand upon the youth. We want to give knowledge to the younger generation and be part of changing the game. So how do we take the tools that as we are unveiling the My Schools Today application today, how do we take this and then involve the youth so that we can become and make this project great? So one of the ways is we first address the underlying issues. Africa has a burgeoning population that can either be seen as a challenge or potential for growth for the continent. Emerging markets face a daunting list of issues in Africa, such as child labor, FGM, child marriages, period poverty, and 
several others. And these issues can only be overcome with more education. And for both children and adults alike, because adults also do learn as well. And education is this passage to progress that can only be seen if we are able to come together and see the value of it. So by mapping out schools, whether um, it's in very remote regions or within our cities, we provide children, young people and adults alike the knowledge of what education is available in their local area, which is very important because that means that people are able to understand and be part of seeing their bigger picture or the framework that they can be part of. Another way is by ownership. Having students learn how the data is collected and be actively involved in the process. And mutual engagement, engaging youth networks all across the continent. A lot of these youth networks are involved in education, they're involved in youth empowerment and giving youth a voice. Educating them and partnering with the schools and ministries directly, like for example, with the Ghanaian government, that's very, it's part of the whole process so that we can eventually be able to ensure that everyone all over the continent of Africa has access to quality education. Within SDSN Youth, there is a continent-wide reach through the Global Schools Advocates, the SG Students Program, and the Local Pathways Fellowship. Who all focus on education in various different ways in their local communities. Collaboration with these programs will produce a better result in the buy-in for this um, project within the local communities as they are the ones who work directly with the people who will benefit most from this tool. It's not just enough to collaborate, but with the youth or increase their participation in projects, we need to give them as well a seat, a platform at the table so that they can be able to be an effective member and actively implement their ideas that they come up with, provide them with the tools, funds and other resources so that they can actually take part and also be part of the change that they are seeing around them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anita, to discuss exactly how the youth networks are going to engage in this project and the importance of youth empowerment and bringing youth um, into the mapping project. So, uh, Ms. Monica, I would like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. sure. I'm sorry to change the order on you, but I want to make sure no we worries. stay on time. No so. worries. <laughs> yes, I'm hoping that you're able to see the full screen now. Yes, we can definitely see it now. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. So my name is Monica Ndiga. I am the regional director of the Open Mapping Hub, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, with the Humanitarian Open Street Map team. And it's an absolute pleasure to share our work supporting communities and partners that use data to advance the SDGs and how we can further amplify the call to action on my school today. I'll start with a quick background into who we are as HOT, um, as an Ms. international Monica? NGO. Yes. Is there a way to just move the, um, the speak, the present presenter view to the left a little bit so we can see the full slide? I'm sorry to interrupt okay. again. <laughs> sorry, um, I'm having a really bad, okay, good. <laughs> that, Does... That's great, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. So um, we're an international NGO that is um, committed to ensuring that um, our communities and international partners are contributing to map data. And um, beginning 2019, we had um, envisioned uh, doing this in three ways. So ensuring that everyone is counted um, through high quality base map data, the second is ensuring that international organizations, governments have access to um, high quality data, but also that they're able to contribute and um, to contribute to this data and uh, make decisions based on the data. And the third one is really um, the understanding that everyone can engage and contribute to a map based on their, um, the resources that they have uh, at hand. So um, globally, uh, it's estimated that 1 billion people live in places that are not mapped. What this means is that if you're basically uh, living in an area that's not mapped, that means you're unaccounted for. And at the same time, it also means that you're at very high risk of um, disaster and that um, response services are not likely to, to, to get to you. Um, so, um, and how do we, um, how are we able to solve the, the challenge of groups that are unaccounted for? So OpenStreetMap is a collaborative project that brings together people that are able to create a free editable world map 
What this means is that if you're able to contribute to um, OpenStreetMap, you're essentially um, uh, contributing to a process that's open, that's editable. And this means that you're building into a community that's able to advance the sustainable development goals while building um, highly timely data, um, given that a lot of the, the data that we have is, is uh, what we'd call a time bound um, within, within given communities. Um, and uh, taking us a little bit back to uh, 2019, as part of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team um, committed to advancing SDGs uh, by focusing on, on, on uh, SDGs 1 to 6, as well as um, SDGs um, 11 on sustainable cities and communities. Um, 26% of SDG indicators need maps um, and um, in order to get measured. And statistically, um, in Africa um, and Asia, only about 20% of SDGs have available data to monitor. And 35% um, of sub-Saharan African countries have no poverty data that has been updated since 2015, uh, pointing to the fact that there is a huge need to embrace innovative data sources in order to fill these gaps. And when you think through, for example, SDGs 9, uh, open, ma open maps are a powerful tool to measure and monitor many of the SDGs. When you talk of the, um, the need to uh, track the population of the rural population who live within two kilometers of an all season road, uh, one, this is very difficult to measure given the different complexities of the different countries and how people define, for example, um, an all season road. But then it is very important that we actually need to have this road mapped. We need to know where people live. We need to know where people, uh, where people are. If, sorry. Um, so the question is, where can the Map My School project go in the future? And when you think of SDG4 and, and, and the context of how difficult it is to actually track some of these SDGs and monitor uh, implementation. So I'm going to walk you through two examples of um, local communities that are using uh, OpenStreetMap to advance um, sustainable development goal for. One of them is uh, a local community known as Map Uganda uh, that has been working with HOT across seven, uh, seven, seven schools uh, in, in, in Northern Uganda. And through the project, they've been able to train um, over 203 teachers and students. And they're training with uh, these this, um, groups on how to use OpenStreetMap. Training them on how to actually um, add data to OpenStreetMap, but also most importantly, training the teachers to be able to uh, use teachosm.org to uh, conduct their geography classes in school. And why, why is this important? Um, in talking to these communities, they recognize that one, they do have resources in terms of schools, are um, laptops in terms of mobile phones that are assigned to these schools. But then uh, from then on, the teachers mostly will use the, the laptops and the free mobile phones, for example, to, um, um, to teach a, um, a general lesson or to teach the children how to use Word. But they, especially the youth are very keen in terms of what additional skills can they build. And so for them, uh, mapping mobile data collection, GIS is something that's of, 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 of high interest and of high um, 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 interest to, to the teachers as well. And through that, they've been able to build interest um, in these groups in teachers as well as the, the students. Uh, the second project that I'll speak to you about is um, a school in Peru. So uh, uh, beginning 2017, there are only about 700 schools that were on OpenStreetMap in Peru, but to date we have a total of 108, 523 schools that have been um, uh, mapped on OpenStreetMap. And um, this has been done through kind of a seven step process. First of all, uh, identifying the different categories of schools that need to be mapped from the lower primary through to the tertiary level, um, lots of community buying, um, seeking licenses, documenting, and also importing a lot of data on OpenStreetMap and uploading that. So we've, we've been able to see a huge growth in terms of the number of schools that actually have been, have been mapped on OpenStreetMap through a collaborative effort. And um, so for today, um, what can we all do? So the first thing is if you're a student or if you know a school in your area, add the school in OSM, become a youth mapper at your university or start a youth mapper chapter. Uh, most importantly, if you are an educator, use OSM to teach geography in classroom through teachosm.org. 
And if you're working with the National Statistics Agency, uh, a mapping agency or a donor, uh, encourage school location data sets to be shared openly for collaboration with citizen mappers, as this has been shown to actually um, advance towards mapping of schools and mapping of um, infrastructure such as roads um, that are really important in uh, delivering services to schools. Thank you. Thank you so much for that detailed information. I know we all were really looking forward to hearing exactly how we can engage in this project. Now we have a little bit of time left for Q&A. So I encourage any of the participants in this session to please post their questions in the chat. And I will pose these questions to the three panelists that we have here, Anita, Jason, and Monica. So we do have one question in the chat so far about um, how people get engaged in the responsibility for mapping schools and can it only be taken up at the state and local government level and does it require a countrywide initiative or are individuals able to mobilize community by community and participate? So this maybe could be a question for Jason and Monica, um, how people can participate if they don't have a countrywide initiative in their specific country in Africa. Jason, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so in terms of how people can participate uh, in instances where there isn't um, a, a, an ongoing campaign, so I'll, I'll take us back to kind of the, um, the two committees that I mentioned, that um, you can start off um, 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 a local uh, intervention, um, self-mobilized intervention, and uh, begin actually adding data to OSM. And for this, you don't need to be part of, for example, an existing wider uh, initiative. Um, the reason being that um, o OSM is, is really uh, open source. And this means that you can uh, create a, um, a, an independent sort of uh, task manager project and, and, and begin adding um, the, the details or the resources on what you want to map in your locality. Uh, but I'll also um, encourage you to um, reach out to other um, organizations or other networks and be able to do this as, a, as what we call like as a collaborative effort. I think that also helps in terms of increasing the number of contributors that you can get or the number of um, kind of resources that you can bring together to be able to, to, to start an initiative in your country. So based off of our experience, uh, some of our most um, interesting or um, very proactive groups have been very self-mobilized. Uh, local communities sometimes are not uh, uh, formally, for example, registered, but have an interest in actually um, mapping their initiatives. Great, thank you. Jason, do you have anything to add to that? So the, uh, the Survey123 app is part of the program. You can map anywhere in the world. You don't need anything. You, any, you can go to any the map. The app itself has maps for, for the whole world, so you can map anything inside that. If you want to do more curriculum-based uh, classroom activities, if you go to just Google uh, teach, with, teach with GIS, uh, and that will, that will take you there. But I'm sure we'll be putting other uh, education resources out on, the, uh, on social media as well. And it can be um, used by educators that are not in Africa as well, correct? Mm -hmm. The whole world. Yes. The whole world. Great. So yeah. any, I know there's a question in the chat about how do individuals get involved um, and maybe they might be outside of Africa. So that's great to hear that they also can use the resources and be involved. Um, I'd like to pose a question now to Anita. There's a question on how to build community around mapping and, you know, getting people engaged and involved. And I think maybe you can speak to um, your youth engagement, you know, how to get people excited around this mission um, in that answer. <laughs> Okay, true. Yeah, so I would say that the easiest way to build a community is to first go, I wouldn't say person in person because the COVID situation, but um, trying to get people to understand it at their level. So for example, if it is like young children or students who are of a, um, like not yet reached high school, it would be more useful in this situation to have like a one-to-one -one conversation with them to explain how the data is collected, why we need to collect the data and how it will be used afterwards. Because the thing that um, you see most when you are trying to engage a community, whether it's young people, old people, is that you have to be able to be open to communicate to them the whole process so that they can also have a buy-in and take ownership of it for themselves. So I would say that's the easiest way to 
get a community just to basically back a project. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Jason, there's another question about how the data stays up to date over time and um, you ensure that it's always accurate. So could you please comment on that? Again, I, th I think that's just the growth of the, of the program, really, and continually uh, refreshing that, maybe putting stand there. There's ways and methods of running these projects to actually keep coming back and visiting this data. Hopefully, you're, you're going to sustain the schools are going to want to be involved in the, sort of, in the geospatial aspect of it. You want to just embed that as a, as a process inside their curriculum. So that's just what they, they hopefully the school would update their own data. You know, if things change in their school, they can do it as well. So there's not golden, there's not one sort of single answer to that. You know, it's just, just um, it's, Keeping the, just keeping the pressure on and just keeping keep working at it and making sure everyone sees the value in it and is getting value from it, then it, then it will work. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, there is uh, another question about safety as oftentimes um, journeys to schools for students, um, there's a lot of protection and safety concerns. Um, so it would be great if someone could comment on how safety is can taken into account um, in this project as school children are often vulnerable to road crashes and, and other things and maybe these contexts. I could say something about, so no one else has got any. Uh, uh, so with, with the with the resource that I created, like the, the idea of actually, where am I as a child and where is my school? My, what is my route to school? I want the child to be thinking about actually their route to school and what's going on. And one of the things we would like to do as the program develops is then start to, instead of actually measuring trees or animals in the environment, we measure the child. So how does the child feel on that journey to school? Where do they feel safe? Where do they feel unsafe? And start to map those locations. So we can start to, if we did that, for the whole school, hopefully you'll start to see areas that actually start to think, well, what, what's the issue here? And all, there's also a call, a call to action in that resource as well. Uh, if you see something that, that you want to change, well, do something. Write, write a letter to the head teacher, write a letter to a local councillor, write a letter to parliament that we want to see this change because it's, it's unsafe. So it's almost using the children to actually map out the environment as they perceive it from, from, their, from their experience and then act, acting on that. Yeah, that's great to hear that it's it's also used as an advocacy tool and, and you want students to take action um, beyond mapping the data. Um, and I'm just seeing quickly, let me just check the chat to see if there's additional questions. Um, let's see. There's a question about data quality. Um, and because it's an open source um, map, what are you going to do about um, data quality, potential ramifications on data quality? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that question. Yes, so um, on, on data quality, um, a key component of uh, mapping, whether it's remote mapping through you know, satellite imagery or it's local mapping where you have students actually um, map um, facilities um, that they use, then there's an additional component that ties it all together and that's uh, data validation or sort of ground truthing. So uh, for quality and completeness, um, so a, couple, a number of projects um, will have, um, for example, train validators or actually um, train a local community in order to validate that data. So um, it's, it's, an, it's an added um, sort of that step, but that's very critical um, and, and could be improved by things like uh, how well the, the training or how to do the mapping is done um, to ensure that the, the, there's kind of a second, um, what is called eye to the data that you, you already have there, especially with remote mapping where uh, it can be difficult, for example, to tell the difference between um, a main road and a, and a, and a, you know, and a service road, um, or uh, sometimes a tree can be confused for something like um, um, a, a small toilet structure. So then validation becomes a very important component of, uh, of any mapping exercise. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, I just want to also mention, I see that uh, Chief Nat and the minister are still on the line. So if there's anything you want to come in on, um, please feel free as well, but it's also not a requirement. Um, so I think I would love to hear from all of you in uh, your own words, all three of you, um, why this is really important to achieving SDG4 and, and what is your um, statements towards the audience, towards schools that are getting involved, um, your inspiring words, you know, to really push this forward. So Anita, could we start with you? 
Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah. So for me, this is it's a it's a tool that will bring about um, change in how um, the education is looked at in Africa because now you have the data to back up what has been said all these years. So that's important to me because I am a child of the continent. I've been I've grown, been raised here, and I have studied in schools within the continent as well. So I know um, the needs of the countries the countries in Africa. So I understand the need for this and I totally um, see how it can help to map out and even provide like better education for places where we had no information before because it was just not feasible prior to this. So for me, it just shows that we are taking a step in the right direction and that direction will end up with all students all over Africa being part of a bigger thing where we're learning to not only um, someone is doing for us, but we're also taking part in it as um, Monica said, where we are, we start youth chapters and start to map out. And so it's, it's also involving youth, which I think is such an important thing because we are the next part of the society where the people who are going to take it up from um, the people who are before us as well. So I think that's, um, it's, it's just inspiring to see. Thank you so much. Uh, Monica, do you have any words on that? Or um, Minister, if you want to come in as well. Uh, uh, thank you so much. They have been very insightful in terms of the experts knowledge in this area and what we can take away is that is, we have another set of tools that we can use for education transformation. I also want to say that I have another meeting, so I would really, really beg of you to I move on, but I'll touch base with you again. And this is a very exciting conversation. And, and um, I believe it's something that most people, um, educationists and uh, leaders in education will find very useful. So thank you for such a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we perfectly understand. And thank you for those remarks. Um, we were so honored to have you here today. Mm -hmm. Um, I will just maybe get a closing statement from Monica and Jason on that same question. Um, why is this important for SDG4? Um, and in general, why is data literacy important for the SDGs? Mm -hmm. So Monica. Okay. Um, this, is, this is really important because especially when we empower, for example, pupils or teachers, then that means we are actually transferring power to the very people that are affected, for example, by um, any disasters or that are affected by any humanitarian crisis. And when those people are actually contributing to say an open street map, then um, they are creating ideally a free, open, shareable um, uh, tool that can be updated over time, uh, which is then a huge benefit for the My, Schools, um, My School Today project. Thank you. Um, and Jason? Thanks, Amanda. So for me, just thinking about generally about geospatial mapping technology in, in education, for me, for me at the heart of it, what it does, it places every single child in the center of the map and they can see themselves and how they are connected to their local environment and then to a wider global environment. So every single child is, is, in, that, is in that place and they can learn from it. Their spatial awareness can grow and grow. And we can introduce so many other different topics into it, whether it's mathematics or it's creative writing, uh, or it's computer science, or it's gaming. We can start that. It's all has all these things have a geospatial element to it, and embedding that in, 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 into teaching, I think it's going to be vital for us going forward with things like sustainability. Thank you so much, all of you, for those comments. Um, it was really amazing to have you join us today as panelists and for this important Q and A as well. Um, so just to close out, here is a list of all of the supporters, collaborators, and partners that are working on this project together. This is um, the launch of the open call to join um, the actions to map schools. Please reach out to us if you need more guidance or have activity ideas that could mobilize more communities. I've seen a lot of exchanges are happening in the chat, so I hope you've been sharing emails as well as links. So our data set, you can find it on the SDGs Today website. All the information that you will need and everything is now live. So the first phase of the call to action will continue until the UNGA, which is the United Nations General Assembly, which takes place in late September. We'll be hosting a variety of webinars and workshops throughout August and September, so please stay tuned and follow SDGs 
opportunities today on Twitter, as well as check their website to get all of the information on the additional webinars we will be doing as well um, to discuss more about this and to really improve and talk about how we're doing the mapping. So um, you can also see all the educational material on the SDGs Today website if you are a teacher or educator. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We are so happy to have had you here to have this launch of my schools today. Please follow SDGs Today on Twitter. Thank you to all of our supporters, to our speakers, to our panelists, and to our honorable distinguished guests. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your um, morning, evening, and afternoon, wherever you are, and um, we look forward to this incredible and important project. Thank you.